Kraft's miniature liquors start from raw materials. Lead, tin, zinc, fine woods such as yellow poplar and red oak. They mix and roll their own metal so that they can be sure that the exact proportions of lead and tin are used. For example, some pipes are made of 75% tin and 25% lead, while others are 60% tin and 40% lead. The different proportions will make different sounds. The mixing is so exact that Mr. Schlicker could say that a certain roll of metal was 52% tin and 48% lead. Before the interview and before I talk to Louis Rothenbeeker, one of the voicers, which you'll hear in a little while, I watched Mr. Schlicker walk through his factory. He gave us a tour. And he would walk along and touch the different dismantled organs, the racks of pipes, as though... They were children, they were his children, and he was reassuring them and just keeping himself in touch with what was going on. There were two organs that had come back to the factory. They had been caught in early summer floods, and there's sort of an art restoration going on because these instruments are as much pieces of art as the music that is played on them. Each one is an individual. Each one has a lot of attention paid to it. Pipe making is a whole art. On this tour, I didn't get to see pipes actually being made, although I have in the past, and the best I can remember, there would be rectangles of a certain blend of metals laid out on a table, all cut to the, to the proper sizes for the different notes of a rank of pipes. The rectangle of metal is curved around so that the two long edges meet, and then it is welded together in one stroke from the top to the bottom. This stroke takes a lot of practice to learn, because if you touch the pipe too hard, you put a hole in it. If you don't put it, touch it hard enough, you don't seal it. And obviously, if it's going to sound at all, there's got to be no holes there either from too much pressure or too little pressure. Another art in making the pipes is the voicing of them. The voicer is in charge of making a whole rank of pipes sound alike. This means that they have to be the same loudness. They all have to speak with the same quickness or slowness. I talked to Louis Rothenbeeker, who is one of the two voicers at Schlicker, He's working on a two-thirds rank of pipes that will be put into a mixture. He starts out by explaining what a mixture is. Yes, a mixture is made up of uh, anywhere from two ranks to ten or twelve, but generally uh, our organs uh, have just uh, three ranks to five ranks, sometimes a little bit more, but uh, this particular uh, mixture has uh, five ranks, and I'm working on the two-thirds rank right now. So when an organist pulls one stop, he'll get anywhere from two to five ranks of pipes? Yes, that's correct. Perhaps I should explain here that a rank is one set of pipes. Each one corresponds to one note on the keyboard or manual. Each rank is named by the length of the pipe of its lowest note and by its sound. For instance, an eight-foot principal, a 16-foot quintadina, a one-foot siflute. The eight-foot pipe is considered unison pitch. In other words, it's the same pitch as that corresponding key on, say, a, a piano or something. An octave below that would be a 16-foot pipe, and then there are 32-foot pipes so there an are octave pipes below that. that are that. halves of the eight-foot, like four-foot, two-foot, one-foot, each an octave above the other. And what's a two-thirds rank? A two-thirds rank is uh, a fifth above one-foot pitch. I asked him what it meant to voice a pipe. Voicing is uh, simply getting the pipe to speak uh, the right pitch and the right uh, texture, you might say. Uh, when we get the pipe from the, uh, the pipes, I should say, from the pipe shop, uh, they make very little sound. Some of them don't make any sound at all. So our job is to uh, voice them and tune them uh, prior to being sent on the road or on the job installation, church or home, or whatever it might be. Well, what's the first thing you do if you get a pipe that doesn't speak at all? very first thing uh, 
Mr. Schlicker always says you have to look at the pipe first. <laughs> you don't listen so much, but you have to, you listen after uh, you've looked it over and, and made sure everything is uh, in its proper place. Uh, block and uh, the windway and the upper lip and lower lip and so forth. What's the windway? The windway is uh, a little space uh, between the languid and the lower lip. It's called the windway or the flute. But between the what? The languid or black, which yeah. is this thing here. Okay. And the lower lip, which okay. is the outside of the pipe. What he's showing me is a small pipe and uh, he's showing me a little opening that you might see on a whistle, uh, the athletic director's whistle. And uh, that little opening is what is the windway. This pipe here has just been put on the table. And it, uh, it doesn't make any sound, as you can hear. So by looking at this pipe, everything seems to be fairly straight. But the one thing that is wrong with this pipe is the fact that the Languid is, is too high. In other words, it has to be lowered. So we do that by uh, tapping it very gently on my head. And then we oh. blow it by mouth just to check ourselves. It speaks fairly well. So now we can put this on the. Uh, now, now that's table. called the what that you this just tapped? This is tap? called. The, the thing you just tapped. The languid. Languid. Yes. Okay. A languid is a piece of metal inside the yeah. pipe, lying horizontally it in the pipe just below the No, pipe. no, it's, uh, it doesn't vibrate. It just uh, acts as a, a windshield. In other words, the wind strikes that languid. Mm -hmm. If the languid is too high, the wind will not strike it uh, correctly, and the wind will uh, uh, just uh, be diverted, mm -hmm. and the pipe will not sound. So it has to be in proper, uh, proper place. Okay. So now we can uh, see if it plays on the. This is called a voicing table. Okay. It has a chest and, and keyboard. The pipe is speaking a little bit fast. In other words, it wants to blow its octave, so we have to slow it up. In other words, I went a little bit too far, so I have to maybe give it one tap back the other way. And you, this happens uh, on just about not every pipe, but. Uh, it's rare that you put make one adjustment and put the pipe on the table and it speaks the way you want it to. You have to uh, work at it, you might say. Okay. So I just gave that two very little taps. This is right now. This is, I would leave this pipe. This pipe is ready to be uh, tuned now. Mm -hmm. That's pretty well in tune because I pre-cut them before to a length stick. So now we can uh, leave this pipe. Uh, it's a little bit long. Mm -hmm. It's longer than it should be, but uh, very little. And uh, we do this... Uh, for the simple reason is that we don't want to take any chance of being too short when we ship the pipes to, uh, to the job site or church. Mm -hmm. Of course, once you get on the, uh, in the church, you then have to uh, go through every rank. You uh, hoist the pipes very finely. You, uh, you will take much more care uh, in getting them even. See here the pipes are, are left very uh, rather assertive because it's a little bit easier to make the pipe softer uh, in the church rather than uh, making them louder because sometimes when you have to make pipes louder you then have to uh, lengthen the pipe and if you don't have, if your pipes are too short to begin with you may run into trouble so this way if you leave the pipes a little bit longer and force the pipes uh, fairly loud then you're pretty well, pretty safe and then you have to go through each rank of pipes in the organ and balance them correctly to the other rank, so one one rank will not dominate the other. Right. The sounds you hear in the background are the voicer in the next room tuning another rank of pipes. His chest is plugged into the same circuit that our tape recorder was, and the clicks that you'll hear over the next few minutes come each time uh, he takes a long time ago, oh, years, I saw someone voicing a, a rank of pipes, and he would take the pipe and dent it in certain places. Is that an old practice? Is that an 
obsolete practice, or is that only used well, for was, certain kinds of yeah, things? Yeah, he, he was uh, uh, putting nicks in the pipes. In other words, the nicks went in this area here, the languid area, and this uh, nicking is came about oh in the late 1800s because uh, the organs were being uh, they were using higher pressure and it was very very difficult to voice the pipes unnicked. So this practice just just kept on, but now we're we're down uh, we're lowering our pressure now to uh, what it was 400 years ago, 300 years ago. So now we don't we don't have to nick the pipes. We can voice them as uh, as they did back in uh, Bach's time. I asked Mr. Schlicker about nicking later at lunch, and he said that nicking has a tendency to kill the harmonics, the overtones in a pipe. So therefore, it's not desirable if you can do without it. Do tuning and voicing? Do you have to sort of play one off against the other? That's do right, they have? Yes, because any time you make a pipe louder, you have to tune flat. You have to make the pipe longer. But the most difficult part of uh, tuning is done initially when you voice because you have to cut pipes and uh, and to roll the, roll the pipe out. See, some pipes are tuned with this little roller or scroll, mm -hmm. and this is uh, on my dad here. This we this we have to cut the pipe the length on these uh, pipes that do not have scrolls, and then we use a a tuning cone to uh, do the uh, the final the fine tuning. And this is simply uh, flaring, uh, flaring the pipe out or uh, coning it in slightly. And will that change the way it sounds at all, or just no, it just change? unless you uh, abuse the pipe by uh, by hitting it too too high. Mm -hmm. What makes a, a principle sound like a principle? A gadek sound like a gadek? Is it the material, or what? What is yes. it? Yes, material and uh, scaling. Scaling is. Uh, is a means by which uh, all our stops are uh, fitted into the church. In other words, if you have a, a large church, then you would tend to scale a little bit larger. In other words, make the body diameters a little bit larger than, uh, I'm talking about just strictly principles now, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit larger than you uh, would in a smaller church because you have to make, you have to get more sound, obviously. You need a bigger pipe. You will get a, a fuller sound uh, or a fluey sound with a wider uh, scale pipe than you will with a thinner scale pipe. A thinner scale pipe will uh, will give you a stringy tone. Hmm. But that's just, uh, that's not even half of the scaling. The rest of it comes with the mouth uh, width and the mouth cut up and so forth. That all is taken into consideration. Let's listen to him voice one more pipe. This would be the uh, lowest pipe, this is of the two-thirds rank. In other words, we would play the C, this is the one pipe that would sound, along with three other ones. Mm -hmm. So we just set it on, and we just, see, yeah. I went through this already and uh, pre-cut them and pre-voiced them. See, all our pipes have to be uh, what we call uh, pre-voiced. We set them out on the table, we simply uh, blow into the pipe, and we can hear uh, certain things uh, that way, and it's uh, much faster. And after this is done, uh, then we set the pipes on the voicing table. And this is done, uh, most importantly, for just tuning. We have to tune these pipes then against the rank back here. The pipe is a little fuzzy, so what we'll do, and it's loud also, so we'll just uh, go ahead and uh, make the windway a little bit narrower. The pipes don't have to be this loud. Sometimes you try to push them too far and you end up with a very bad tone. That's better. Mm -hmm. This one is a little, uh, what do we call it? chiffy. The chiff is? Chiff. I think that word was coined by E. Power Biggs. Uh, chiff is simply. Uh, the consonant before the vowel, you might say. Pipe can be overly chiffy to a point where it's poor speaking. Mm -hmm. See, there's a, there's a line there that you have to draw. But some of that you want. You want some of that uh, character in there. In fact, there are some ranks you might 
go for a, a heavy yes chips and for instance an eight foot would be a little back. bit uh, chiffy right so i'll blow into it and see if i can uh, narrow it down uh, to what the problem is the pipe is slow remember the first pipe we worked on was fast this one is slow so we have to then do just the opposite of what we did before we uh, put the block down a little bit a little better but still needs more work. I think we have to bring the uh, upper lip a little bit closer. That's better enough. This one is a little softer. Let's make that a little louder. See, that's slow. See, I made one adjustment, and that changed another aspect of the uh, voicing. The pipe spoke fairly well before, but it was soft. I made it a little bit louder, and then got slow. So I have to make another uh, another adjustment here. And then you, that you do by first you have to look at the pipe. This adjustment can be made in in two places, either the uh, upper lip be brought out or the black can be brought down. It's just uh, a matter of deciding what you like to do, or what should be done, I should say. In this, in this case, the black is a little bit high, mm -hmm. so we want to bring that down a little bit. Before we put it in again, uh, we'll blow the pipe by mouth. It's almost perfect. Sometimes you get lucky here the first time. The pipe is much louder than it was before. And so on and so forth until you get to the uh, very smallest pipe and then you remove the pipes from the table and uh, put another rank back on. Before we go hear the instrument, in the past few years, there has been a renaissance of the old mechanical action or tracker action organs. Schlicker organs also feature slider chests. Well, Mr. Schlicker, tracker Schlicker action is a mechanical that. action organ. When you press the key down, then it's trackers running back to the valve, so to the chest, and you open up the valve mechanically. So when you go down slow, you feel that the wind goes in slow into the pipe, you can feel that. Eh? So when you have a track action organ in your playing, you can play more staccata, it shows up more legato. Eh? Which on the electric action organ, you can do it. Now, of course, there are so many different tests today. They got the electric, all the electric action, where yeah, the valve is right underneath the pipe, which we don't subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. eh? And then we have the pitman chest now, when we went into the new type of voicing, say so that no nicking and so on, which we've been doing for 25, 30 years now. We immediately changed our pitman chest. Now the pitman chest is mostly used by most builders today in America. Mm -hmm. There is the valve directly underneath the pipe too. Now when we have a track action organ, you have a slider chest, a mechanical chest. That means you have a tone channel. And one valve, if you have six stops on the organ, on the chest, you have only one valve for it. So and then you have a tone channel in between, uh, in between the valve and the pipes, and the, uh, the speech is much better. So you can do that uh, voicing without nicking, full wind, all the voicing is done on the mouth. Eh? Right. No, no cut down on the foot. Our mechanical electric action organs are also slider chest. The slider chest goes back in organ building to the early, early uh, pipe organs three, four, five hundred years back. Eh? And there are organs in Europe which are 300 years old, and that chest is still working. So this chest that we are building today, they're good for another 150, 200 years without any trouble. It's another advantage of the slider chest is too, you don't have any pouches to make without pouches, I mean wells, pneumatic wells, eh? which is we used leather for, and that had to be replaced well, years ago when we had natural tanned leather that lasted 40, 50 years. Eh? But nowadays, in very bad locations in the city where you have, we would say, uh, a lot of pollutions, eh? 
got letters sometimes don't last more than 15, 20 years. Some, they tell us in New York only about 10 years, well, I don't believe it. But on the slide it says today, you don't have to worry about that. Sir. There's no, no pneumatic letter in. There's only a wealth packing in, and well, that's always good for a couple hundred years. You don't have to worry about that. When you have a, a trigger action organ with a slide that says, sir, or even an electric action organ with a slide that says, the blend, if you have an eight and a four and a mixed around, they blend together. Mm -hmm. Where on the other chest, where the valve is underneath, they stay apart, they don't blend. It's just like a chorus where the voices won't blend. So it's the mm -hmm. same thing. We went to First Trinity Lutheran Church nearby, where a Schlicker organ is installed. The organ and the building were planned together. Ken List, who is the assistant to Hermann Schlicker and an organist, gave the following demonstration of how the pipes on a classically voiced organ blend and complement each other. In considering the tonal aspect of the modern organ, and the modern organ is what we would call a classical organ, not because it can only be used for classical music, but because, like the literary sense classical, it's a type of instrument which has withstood the test of time. In considering, again, the tone of the classical organ, we must adjust our thinking to think in terms of choruses and ensembles of stops interacting and interrelating with other stops, rather than simply a collection of miscellaneous and highly characteristic sounds which may or may not blend together. We can demonstrate rather simply the effect of this interaction by listening on this organ to the effect of the principal or chief chorus of the organ as found on the great manual. It's a chorus which consists of four elements. First of all, a principal eight foot, which sounds like this. This is foundation tone, unimitative, and completely identifiable with the organ. The second element is the four-foot octave, which plays an octave higher. The third, the two-foot octave, which plays two octaves higher. The last element is a mixture stop, which sounds for each key a mixture of tones and provides, in essence, harmonics for the entire division. It's never played in chords alone, but it has this interesting sound. As one ascends the keyboard. Listen to the effect now of compiling those elements together remembering that although the resulting sound in each case is composite, its effect is of a single tone, starting with the eight and adding these elements. clarity of that sound is obtainable only because the individual members of that chorus are voiced in such a way that they are in all ways independent and interdependent upon and with the other members of their chorus. Another aspect of the classic voicing which is important is what we might call derivative sound. By derivative sound we imply that the sound which reaches the ear may be only derived from this interaction of other stops. A case in point, on the great organ we have a so-called 16-foot stop which plays an octave lower 
than unison pitch. Normally, a 16-foot stop could be associated with heaviness and opaqueness. Yet if one listens to the individual tone of the 16-foot stop, it's not only very light, but frankly, almost the same stop when played underneath the four-element principal chorus will gain tremendously in intensity and yet without any heaviness. First the chorus without the 16 foot. And with the 16 foot. Playing in chorus without the 16 foot at a higher portion of the keyboard. without heaviness. This will characterize all sounds in the classical organ, no matter how they're used. Take another case in point. In the swell division of the organ, the so-called romantic part of the organ, we have what are called string and string celeste stops, quiet, appealing sounds of this nature. But by the addition of other voices to the string in Celeste, we have a broad, wide, lovely tone, which is really made up of several classical elements, the result of which is still a single, unified kind of sound, lovely in all of its considerations. chief means of expression for the organ, in addition to the simple addition and subtraction of stops, is what is called the swell box or expression box. This consists of a wooden enclosure in which the pipes sound, the front of which is fitted with louvers like Venetian blinds, which can be opened or closed from a pedal which the organist operates. They provide an element of crescendo and decrescendo which would otherwise not be possible with the pipes themselves. To be sure, it doesn't possess the finesse of the piano or the violin, but it is the organ's poor excuse for crescendo and decrescendo. The effect with softer stops is this, starting with what organists call the box closed. is most noticed when a large a number of stops are drawn. Perhaps no greater example exists of the effect of derivative sound than that which is produced by what in organ terms is called the cornet. The cornet is an ancient name and refers to a solo stop made up again of individual elements. The complete cornet, so called, has five such elements and are identified by these musical pitch names. First of all, the eight foot or unison, the octave, or forefoot, 
the twelfth, or two and two thirds, which reinforces the third harmonic. The two foot playing three octaves above, two octaves, excuse me, above unison. And last, the tierce, or one and three fifths foot pitch, which sounds two octaves and a major third above the given pitch. Curiously enough, again, these diverse elements, when played together, will form one composite sound of tremendous interest. And by eliminating one or several of them in the chorus, different effects can be achieved. Playing the same simple arpeggio over and over by simply adding and subtracting from the basic five-stop cornet, with the complete we have cornet. the following. Such a sound is extremely useful for the playing of ornamented melodies, either bold ones or in its lighter form for extremely delicate ones. So you see this kind of multum in parvo, much in little quality, is possessed by the classically voiced organ. Each stop pulls not only its own weight, but fully half the weight of others. And certainly in this day of even artistic economic considerations, that's an important thing to remember. Now not all of the organ sound, of course, is limited to quiet tones. The massing of many stops together will produce sounds of tremendous intensity, and also there are stops called reed stops, which of themselves have large intensity. The most common or foundational of these are common to all good organs. The first is the trumpet. The second is called a crumb horn an ancient sound. The oboe, or shalmai. Often played with the tremulant the basson, or fagot, slightly imitative of the bassoon and appearing at 16-foot pitch. And lastly, a sound which must be considered when played alone, frankly obscene, is the posaun, the heavy sound maker in the pedal. These marvelous sounds, however, when combined with the other stops of the organ, produce sounds of tremendous intensity. Listen, first of all, to perhaps a slightly out of tune, but nonetheless extremely interesting chorus made up of only the reed and mixture stops in the organ. It's a sound of large intensity. Compare, if you will, that sound with the equivalent amount of sound made by only the flu stops, a smoother, more bright sound. And, of course, one can always, in times of musical joie de vivre, put them all together 
and the effect is very much like this. that. The last sounds which the organ must be considered in terms of are what we might call its intimate sounds, the quiet chamber music sounds which it possesses that are not only extremely useful in the playing of liturgical services, but are absolutely the backbone of the most interesting organ literature. They are represented in small sounds such as this, the positive gedeckt, a covered stop made of wood very articulate and extremely sweet. The Rohrflute, or in its German pronunciation, Rohrflater, is an interesting flute stop which wears not only a little hat, but has a little chimney on top. It has a hollow kind of sprightliness. can clearly even be heard over mimeograph machines and things in churches. <laughs> a funny old classic stop, made of very wide, fat little pipes, was given the rather, for German, poetic name of Nachthorn, the horn of the night, and it has this rather thick but lovely sound. The Sif flute, the whistling flute, is so called because the extreme highness of its pitch carries it to almost astronomical levels. Listen to a chromatic scale played on that stop, starting with the lowest pipe. Almost beyond hearing. But what the most fun is, is to combine these small sounds to make sounds of tremendous interest. Starting again with our friend the eight-foot cadet, the wood member of the positive, and adding its neighbors. keyboards and the multiple kinds of sound is for rapid changes in volume, echoing effects as it were. The more stops and keyboards an organist has within certain artistic limitations, the more flexibility he has in producing sounds 
and effects for, for specific purposes. This is not to say, however, that the size of an instrument is any merit whatsoever of its effectiveness or of its artistic quality. Beautiful instruments have been built of only a handful of stops and a single keyboard without pedals, just as, conversely, organs with thousands and thousands of pipes and many keyboards have been total artistic failures. Always the importance is quality, not quantity of sound. Not how large, but how beautiful. Not how enormous, but how enduring and how fine. Nothing, perhaps, is so grand as a pipe organ. Nothing requires so much work and toil in the musical industry as a pipe organ. But certainly nothing is so worthwhile and so meaningful as that same instrument. The sound is many things to many people, but by all means it is certainly grandeur and greatness, pageant, history, and hopefully things modern and future as well. All of us who build these instruments are filled with the hope and kept going by the love that we feel for them. And we hope that that love throughout our industry all over the world can be denoted in the sounds we produce. Mm -hmm.